Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to the talk. Um, if anyone doesn't know me, my name is Amir Rosenfeld, as is evident, and I'm a postdoc here with John Sotos. And uh, this talk will be mostly a practical talk about uh, deep networks. So uh, if anyone here is doing only purely theory, like proving things on paper and never doing anything with a computer, which is great and fun and really does have to do with the more interesting problems that we have, and so this, is talk, and this talk is not for you, it's really actually for practical uh, purposes. Okay, so let's start uh, the outline of the talk. Uh, this will be about three major kind of parts. The first is which deep learning framework to choose. The second is, which is really a spoiler for the first point, PyTorch, a quick and easy uh, intro. And finally, how to debug your neural network. Now, we're going to have a few kind of built-in bonus features, which is lots of pointers, or a moderate amount of pointers to resources and useful things. And uh, don't worry about writing anything or remembering anything, because everything will be here. It's actually already here in this link. This link is to a Google Drive folder, which contains the link to the slides. So let's see how Google's you know, indexing deals with this Stack Overflow. OK. Uh, OK, so which deep learning framework should I choose? So there's lots of deep learning frameworks. Uh, I've been playing around with quite a few of these over the years, not all of them, and they each have their ups and downs. And you may have noticed that possibly of all these deep learning frameworks, uh, I didn't mention MATLAB. So I'll just a few words about MATLAB. MATLAB is a really great and nice framework, especially for you know, interactive uh, uh, working. But it does have, and, I, and I've worked with it for a few years during my PhD. Uh, now, uh, it has a, free, a few disadvantages, which is first that it's not really free. It costs a bucket load of money, which may or may not bother you as uh, most of you are here in the academy, so you get it for free, I guess, most of the time. But in the industry, it is a big deal. Um, and it's not open source, so it's not as flexible as you would like. But mainly, uh, it seems to be very slow to catch up with recent trends in the order of months or years behind uh, what we see in other libraries. So that's, uh, if, from my experience, if you uh, really have to choose between learning MATLAB and Python, uh, then go for Python for now. Um, there's, as I said, a lot of deep learning frameworks, and some of them have been around for a while. Uh, for example, like Torch from 2002, and, uh, and Cafe 2012 or 13. Um, and uh, so these two have been around for a while and they were highly popular, but they're not so popular anymore. And they're uh, implemented in a variety of languages with a variety of, uh, of different uh, interfaces. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that the sources for all of the information will be kind of listed here. So if you have any doubts or want to find out more, you can just look at the slides later. Um, OK. So let's see what kind of criteria we would like to, to look at in order to choose. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to mention sure. um, in the last slide. Yeah. Uh, you say what interfaces. Not all interfaces are made equal for each. Um, That's true. Interface. Yeah. So for example, TensorFlow, but back in, um, I think it was TensorFlow or maybe it was Cafe. I can't remember which one. Mm -hmm. That, that's a good point, thanks. Um, OK, so a few criteria we're going to, to look at. One is the popularity, which means, so why is popularity even important? You can look at the size of the supporting community of the framework. Maybe you'll have more places to ask questions, or maybe there's going to be more uh, free implementations or, uh, of uh, things and uh, such. Your requirements are uh, like, uh, is it fast or slow? Is it uh, suited for edge devices or industrial purposes? And all of that. Um, flexibility, which for some reason doesn't have a bullet point. And uh, the learning curve. Is it easy or difficult to, to learn to begin with? Uh, okay, so let's talk about popularity. So uh, does anyone not know about Google Trends? Uh, 
It's kind of a nifty feature of Google where you can just enter search words and look for their trends, how popular they were over time. So here I've uh, narrowed down to the probably four most popular today uh, deep learning frameworks, which are TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, and uh, Cafe. Uh, and we, we can see the trends over the past few years. Uh, so a couple of notes about this is that, first of all, both Keras and Cafe are words that exist outside of the context of deep learning. I don't have to explain what is Cafe to any of you. And Keras is apparently something like horn in Greek, uh, which has to do something with the reason that Francois Cholet, the creator of Keras, chose this name. Uh, and so these are actually overestimations of their popularity. And uh, we, we can see that uh, PyTorch is kind of slowly, not slowly, rapidly rising, but not up to uh, TensorFlow yet. And TensorFlow is currently the leading one. So TensorFlow is the clear winner in terms of popularity, but uh, we have many kind of deserters popping up from TensorFlow to PyTorch and uh, a lot of new papers with the first implementation in PyTorch. So, uh, and in addition, um, we can talk about the relative popularity or we can talk about the absolute numbers. Uh, so although it is currently a much larger community for TensorFlow, the, uh, for PyTorch it's really huge still. And uh, it's as if I'm asking you, would you rather have a $1 billion or $10 billion? At some point, the difference doesn't any, uh, make any practical, you know, uh, have any practical implication anymore. So once you reach, uh, reach a critical mass, it doesn't really matter. And there is this critical match for PyTorch. OK, uh, now about specific requirements. Um, there's not a lot of requirements that you can fulfill with one framework and you can't with the other in terms of speed, flexibility, uh, and things like, uh, like that. Uh, but TensorFlow does have a couple of advantages, such as production capabilities, which means that it is more suited for, for large-scale computations and tests uh, for now, and it is more suited for computation on ed edge devices. Uh, they do have interfaces that support that better for now. Uh, so, again, from kind of this is a rule of thumb, or, uh, which is, <clears throat> I think it's true for now, I'm not sure it's going to be true for the future. If right now you're going to go to the industry and you must choose, do I want to learn PyTorch or TensorFlow, I would go for TensorFlow. Only from this perspective of actual going to work. On the other hand, it takes five minutes to learn PyTorch, so you can do that as well. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, learning curve, uh, I would say this is possibly the single largest uh, difference between the two. Um, a main difference between TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch is something called dynamic versus static computation graphs. So when you define uh, a program or a flow uh, of computation in, uh, in TensorFlow, you do it all in advance. So you define the structure of the network and all of the computations you're going to do um, in this something called a computational graph. And then only after it, you uh, apply all of the computations, you run them. Um, and this, this way of thought uh, first seems kind of less natural to a lot of uh, people. It's not impossible, and you're all pretty smart guys, so you will be able to deal with it. But uh, still, it adds a lot of boiler, boilerplate code, and it's kind of cumbersome, and it's much more difficult to debug from my own experience. On the other hand, uh, PyTorch is, has something which is called define by run, or that's kind of the paradigm where you're able to, to use it. It has dynamic computation graphs, which means you don't have to define everything in advance. You can just write Python code as you're accustomed to, or you should be accustomed to, uh, and it just happens the, the second you, you write it, or the interpreter just runs things. And this also means that you can do these crazy things like loops and uh, if-else and this crazy logic inside your networks. And the, um, the engine behind PyTorch will just deal with everything. Um, so it's more natural and way less headaches. And finally, I can read this tweet from Andrei Karpati. Uh, I've been using PyTorch a few months now, and I've never felt better. I have more energy, my skin is clearer, and my eyesight has improved. So. Uh, with those words, I don't think we have any better words to introduce us to uh, the next part, which is a practical guide to PyTorch. Okay, so there's like a gazillion tutorials out there, 
and I'm probably going to do a worse job than at least 72% of them, just a number off the top of my head. Uh, but I will try to cover the basics and along the way, the way I'll give you a few nifty tools that I hope uh, will be new to at least some of you. Oh yeah, I forgot to say that um, this, uh, I'm going to show some practical uh, things uh, which hopefully will be new to some of you and for those of you who know everything I'm about to say, first of all, I'll lend you my apologies and second, my congratulations. Okay, uh, so setting up. Um, Again, I'm talking about things which are not uh, kind of tightly bound with PyTorch, but things that you should know about. So if everybody knows what Anaconda is and how to use it and why it's so great, we can skip this part. Want to skip this part? A friend. And he's seeing this video as we speak. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, Anaconda. So, um, this is, you could say, a package manager. Uh, meant for scientific computation, which bundles a lot of scientific Python libraries. And uh, one of its main advantages uh, is that it's very convenient and, and allows you to um, maintain environments, which are a way of saying, this is the exact state of all the packages and versions that I'm using for this project. And when I want to use it to another project, I, uh, sorry, when I switch to another project, I can switch an environment and I will always stay consistent with my versions and not mess things up. Um, oh, uh, another point is that things should work well. Everything I say from this point on, on Windows or Mac, although I don't know why you would want to do that, but in essence, they should, okay? So uh, Anaconda, uh, when you download uh, Anaconda, you install it locally and uh, basically you create a new environment for yourself. So you can create an environment with a certain name and you can uh, say what is the version of Python that you want. And of course you can do this as many times as you like until you run out of space or time. And, um, and from, uh, after you've created the environment, you can activate it with this command line, uh, oops, sorry. And, uh, and from that point on, uh, anything you install in that environment, any package will be unique to that environment and it won't mess up with any other environment so that, that you have. So this means, I mean, the important thing to know here is always work within an environment. Don't install things in like the main uh, Anaconda installation. Just work within an environment, activate it, do whatever you need. And when you're done, you can just conda deactivate. This is all in the command line. I'm pretty sure it would, should work, as I said, in other operating, inferior operating systems. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we're ready to install PyTorch, finally. How am I in terms of time? Okay. Um, very simple, again, one command line. This is taken directly from the pytorch.org website. And they have this nice interface to specify if you want another version or another version of CUDA or another operating system. It's all here. And uh, you just do that, it should work uh, out of the box. Uh, and now, finally, we're getting to actually using PyTorch. So what's the workflow? It's pretty trivial. You get some data, you define a model <laughs> to work on that data and the loss function, and you optimize, and that's all, right? So we're done. Can I go home? Okay. Okay. So uh, actually, a real example. This is going to be a semi-live demo. Uh, who knows about Jupyter Notebooks? Yeah? So out of those who didn't raise their hands, who doesn't know about Jupyter Notebooks? Everybody knows? Wonderful. So you know they're a really kind of nice tool. Okay, so um, we're going to do a very small toy example. So I'm going to import uh, NumPy in matplotlib just for visualization. Yeah, uh, let's just so you won't think I'm cheating, I'm restarting this notebook. And everybody, by the, uh, the way, can create their own server to do this, so you can work from home. Yeah, I see a question in the crowd. No, that, yes. no, no question? Okay, just an angry face, that's okay. Is that because of what I said about Mac or Windows? <laughs> okay, so we import uh, NumPy, and for PyTorch, we import Torch, which is the la main library, and Torch Vision. Uh, now we're going to work on a very simple kind of Gaussian toy dataset. 
So we're going to use uh, sklearn. sklearn, by the way, has lots of very nice libraries and especially, I mean, not especially, specifically libraries that uh, functions to allow you to create these toy examples that you can always toy around with. So this one is called just blobs, which basically creates a bunch of Gaussians. So these are 2D Gaussians in 2D. I'm making three of them. And why this didn't work? Because I didn't run the code before. Hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. Now, more useful things. My apologies to anyone who knows this, but they, sklearn has something called train test split. Basically, you could probably implement it with two lines of code, but they already did it, so why not use it? Splits the, your da data and labels randomly into train and test, and here's the visualization. So the red dots are the train and the green dots are the test. We're going to want to learn this. Uh, okay, now a bit about the data structures in Torch. Torch, the basic data structure in Torch is called Tensor. This is just a multidimensional matrix. Uh, and it's very similar to NumPy in that you can uh, define identity matrices or random or whatever and do matrix multiplications. It all looks pretty much the same. This, this is big enough, by the way, I can make it bigger. Yeah, uh, okay. And uh, when you have a number array, you can convert it to a tensor array in two ways. One is to uh, just uh, call the function from NumPy, and then both arrays, uh, both the data structures sh share the same memory, which means that if you modify one, it modifies the other. So here's this zeros. I'm creating a torch from NumPy on this uh, variable x. And when I modify the first place of x and look at the first place of xt, which is the tensor, you can see it changed. But if I just call tensor on x, then it copies over the data, and you can see that it doesn't change. So the first one um, it kind of it remains the same. Um, uh, now, uh, this seems... this. Printing seems kind of cumbersome because it's just a scalar. So if you just want to access the value of a scalar inside a, a PyTorch uh, tensor, you use the dot item function. Uh, by the way, all of this uh, um, uses the latest PyTorch release, which is 1.0 or 1.0 and something tiny. Uh, so it can be slightly in incompatible with older versions, but this is also the most convenient release, so I just suggest using it if you can. Um, okay, so now we're finally going to convert our training and testing data and labels to, sorry, let's just, yeah, um, okay. So we converted it to PyTorch tensors, and we're going to create our first neural network. Now this is an extremely complicated, no, just kidding, a very simple neural network. It doesn't have any nonlinearities, just a linear or a fully connected layer with two inputs and three outputs, which corresponds to the number of classes. And um, each, um, each component in, a Py, uh, in a PyTorch uh, of a neural network is actually derived from a base class called module, uh, which is the base class of all of the... Uh, uh, things that you can uh, call and, uh, and use as parts of a neural network. Uh, and for example, the, the simplest one is an linear, as I said, a fully uh, connected uh, layer. This implicitly says also that it will have a bias term. And another thing which is useful and you should know of is an sequential. Uh, torch and sequential is a very simple uh, module which holds a list of other modules and just call of them, uh, calls all of them in sequence when you apply it to uh, any type of uh, data that, that you want. Okay, so we're going to create in a way a degenerate sequential which holds just one module. This is uh, the my layer module, okay? Okay, uh, and now we're going to go to the optimizer and loss function. So we're going to import sgd from torch.optim and our uh, loss, function, loss function will be the cross entropy loss. Um, we define, since this is a linear, totally linear you know, problem, a learning rate of one, which is usually huge and crazy, but that's okay for now. And we instantiate our optimizer with the model, sorry, 
uh, with the model parameters. Okay, does everybody see that? And we can define the learning rate, and if we want, we can define a momentum and uh, weight decay. But we're not going to do it now because it's a very simple problem. Okay, now uh, also the training, very simple. Um, the, this is the important part to, to kind of know. Um, at each stage in the training, we essentially get a mini batch of data, and we want the optimizer to um, find the gradient of the parameters of the model with respect to the, the loss, right? Uh, so what we do is first zero the gradient. Why do we have to zero the gradient? Because in essence, if we have, we don't have enough memory in our GPU or uh, whatever to hold uh, all of the, the gradients for a large batch, we can compute it in pieces. So basically we can accumulate the gradient over small parts of that uh, mini batch. Um, Okay, so that's why we zero it. But if you would have wanted to accumulate, you could have zeroed every few iterations. Okay, uh, the next thing we do is just call the model with our data. So calling the model uh, with the data just calls the forward function of the model, which is a function that every module has to implement, which actually uh, makes the model uh, apply the computation. Okay. So internally, in this NN linear, it has a forward model, which does the matrix multiply and adding the bias uh, with the data. Um, okay, so we have the predictions. Now uh, we find the maximal value of the predictions. This returns both the values and the argmax, so the predictions themselves, and we can compute the accuracy. And mo most importantly, we calculate the loss. So after we calculated the loss, we call the backward function on the loss. This back propagates the loss through the parameters of the networks, finds all the gradients. And finally, this allows us to make, uh, to call optimizer.step, which calls, uh, makes the optimizer make one step in the direction of the gradient. Um, okay, so basically this is very simple. You just apply the model to the data, find the loss, make one step. That's the whole uh, training loop. So uh, for testing, we do pretty much the same. We just don't do the optimization. And if you want to save memory during uh, testing, you call this wrapped with this torch no grad, which means that it doesn't have to compute gradients along the way. So it only does the forward pass. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, we can put all of this together. Um, in this case, uh, we're not going to have uh, mini batches. We're just going to have epochs because each epoch will use the entire set of data. It's just a few hundred data points. So uh, at each point, we just train the model, which means do one of these uh, apply, uh, find the loss, apply the gradient uh, steps, and test the model. And uh, just for convenience later, uh, I'm going to do this training log. Uh, that keeps track of the training accuracy and test accuracy and loss. So I'm just going to run this whole thing. And as always in live demonstrations, it's not going to work. And let me do that again. Okay, so yeah, I did 20 iterations. It took a mind-boggling 120 milliseconds because this is very tiny data. And uh, since we logged everything, now we can do a visualization. Okay, who knows about pandas? Oh no, I was expecting less people to know about pandas. Okay, so good. So you know pandas is uh, very useful. This is basically a very useful uh, library for data handling and managing and sorting and sifting and slicing. Very useful. Uh, so we put all of this, uh, we accumulated previously dictionaries with the training accuracy and whatnot, and we put this into a data frame, which allows us to say this nicely but also uh, allows us to plot it very easily. So we plot it with x value as the epoch and y value as the train and test accuracy. And we see this beautiful curve, which all of us want to see one day. Train accuracy, test accuracy, yeah. And we can also do that for the loss. Okay, uh, so that's basically it. Now, if you want some more fancy stuff, we can plot the decision boundaries. Uh, I wouldn't worry about too much uh, too much about the code that does this. It's very simple, but I put it here anyway, and it will be accessible to you later. Okay, 
And anyway, I borrowed it and borrowed it from other people. So my main service to you is just coalescing it into one location. Okay, so that's it. We made our first kind of neural network. Um, okay, but now let's go deeper into uh, a few more details if we actually want to work on real data. Uh, okay, so, so Torch has a few useful workhorses that allow us uh, a question there. No? Allow us to actually deal with data efficiently. Uh, the first is Torch Vision, Vision uh, datasets, which are basically iterators over data, and they give us interfaces for iterating, for going over standard datasets like MNIST or CIFAR or STL, uh, or uh, also generic datasets. For example, if you want uh, to do, I don't know, ImageNet, you just arrange all of the images such that each class is in a different subfolder, and if your file structure follows this type of convention, you just call an image dataset instantiated on the root of, so, sorry, a folder dataset with uh, the root of this image folder as uh, the argument, and it wraps it up nice, nicely in an iterator. So, as I said, datasets are just iterators over data. Now, data loaders wrap datasets, and they uh, have mechanisms to call them in a multi-threaded way so that they will be able to load the data very rapidly and efficiently. Um, so they have a few workers which you can define the amount of and they load the data and when you iterate over them they split the data into uh, batches, mini batches of a size you define that include both the, the ground truth and uh, the data itself and uh, optionally you can apply transformations for data augmentation or any other transformation that you need along the way to turn it into the kind of data format that you need. Okay, uh, so as I said, each building block of a convnet in, or any network in Torch is a subclass or descendant of a subclass of an N module, and all you have to do is implement uh, the forward function, and you don't need to implement the backward function because there's aut automatic differentiation. So popular examples are convolution, where you just define the number of input channels, output channels, kernel size, and all of that. Uh, non-linearities, pooling layers, uh, and just to show you, does everyone manage to see this, even at the back? Uh, here's pretty much the entire implementation of AlexNet. So what we see here is a bunch of convolutions, non-linearities, pooling, convolution, non-linearity, pooling, something like five times. And for the fully connected layers of AlexNet, you have fully connected, you have non-linearities, possibly a dropout here and there, and, and that's it. So it's very concise and simple to implement and uh, also to debug. Okay, so if we want to put all of this together, we're going to go to another notebook, not what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, so this is going to be pretty much like the previous one, just that it's going to use another few extra constructs and, and functions of uh, PyTorch. Okay, so um, the, dif the main difference is that we're calling the, using the datasets uh, package and the transform package, and we're going to define a full-fledged neural network to work on uh, MNIST. So uh, we have a few convolutions, this means this has, since MNIST is just a 1D, it's not a colored image, it's a, like a grayscale uh, image, so it has one input channel. The first convolution will have 20 output channels. Uh, each kernel 5 will be of size 1 and a stride of 1, if I'm not mistaken. Another convolutional layer and a couple of fully connected layers. Uh, now, the forward function just doesn't do anything very special. It just calls all of them pretty much in sequence. So first, it gets as input uh, the input and uh, applies the first convolution, the first nonlinearity, and uh, max pooling. So this goes on for a while, and maybe the single uh, <laughs> thing that needs here really to explain is this thing, which flattens the structure of the last convolutional layer before it passes it on to a fully connected layer. So uh, this is pretty much like what you do in NumPy where you reshape something 
into a flat structure. Um, yeah, and eventually it does a log soft max. This is slightly different than what we did before. Before we had just a cross entropy uh, loss, which uh, already included the log soft max inside. And uh, here we do the log soft max, and we're going to have just a negative log, log likelihood loss. But it's really just the same. It depends. It's kind of an implementation detail. Uh, the training and testing are very much the same as you saw before. But as I said, here we do things in mini batches, which means that you iterate over the train lo loader. So uh, you iterate over the train loader, and each time uh, for each iteration, it re returns data, which is a mini batch of data, and target, which is the part of the mini batch of the ground truth that corresponds to that data. And everything else th is the same. Uh, oh, yeah, this two device just means that you move it onto the GPU. I'm going to talk about uh, a bit later about what to do if you don't have any GPUs. Um, and uh, so we switch the data to the GPU, and everything else is pretty much the same. You did the forward pass, uh, back propagate the loss, step the, open, the optimizer makes one step, and you can optionally report the uh, performance. Uh, and the test is the same, just you iterate over the test loader, um, yeah. Okay. So um, now, just an example of what does this test loader and train loader look like for the for MNIST? You uh, can just uh, define that you're using the datasets dot MNIST, okay? Which is one of the standard datasets of uh, PyTorch, but you could just uh, as well use uh, another one that uh, that you define. And you wrap all of this up with a train loader. Uh, and optionally, you can add this normalization, which is the transformation I spoke about uh, earlier. Uh, it transforms all of the images into the tensor data structure and normalizes them so the data is nicely normalized. Um, and that's it. Finally, you define the optimizer, run training test batches, uh, sorry, epochs. And uh, basically, that, that's it. So I can just run all of this now and hope that it runs. And very miraculously, it doesn't run. But that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to the actual slides. OK. So at this point, I would have said, congratulations, you just built your first convnet. So imagine that we did. OK. So uh, what now? As you can see, it's really very simple, or I hope you're convinced by now, or maybe you're, you were convinced before you came here today. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of resources uh, online on PyTorch. So to learn some more basics, you have the actual PyTorch tutorials, which are very well explained and built. And now you're going to spend days or weeks or years looking into these links because they're all really fun and exciting as their names indicate, awesome PyTorch list and the incredible PyTorch, really like a plethora uh, of, of different wonderful links and tutorials and implementations. Now, uh, there are some more resources, not only for PyTorch, that, uh, that you would like to look into. Models is a recent one I ran into, uh, which kind of aggregates a lot of different uh, pre-trained models for different uh, both categories and frameworks and sorts them by uh, popularity, which means the number of stars they got on GitHub or something of the sort. Um, and it's really cool. So anything you would like to kind of just run out of the box, they also have instructions for each one, which I didn't try, uh, but they look pretty solid. Another one is papers with code, which is a little more broad, so it's not only continents, although I assume 95% of it is. Um, yeah, and you can thank me later. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, now we're going to the last part, which is how to debug your neural network. So, you've just made the best network ever. It's really amazing. Your, your eyes start you know, bursting into tears when you think of the consequences and all of the dinner parties and prizes and the president thanking you and saving humanity. But uh, us, it, it just doesn't converge, okay? So 
The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a really nice book by the late Douglas Adams, which is about a lot of things, but it's also about a book. And uh, in the book, he says that the book is one of the most widely popular books in the galaxy, uh, mainly owing to the fact that it has the words don't panic inscribed in large friendly letters on its cover. So don't panic. And let's talk about the different reasons that your neural network may not converge. Um, so I'm hoping some of this will be new to some of you. The first thing is optimization. Um, you can look at the, yeah, is this too small? So the writing about the size of the learning rate is not too small. Okay, so if the learning rate is too low, probably you just, you know, everything doesn't move at all. If it's too high, you may see the loss function really jittering and going crazy. And uh, obviously, you're going to hope that uh, there's something ju just right, so play with the learning rate. That's the most uh, obvious thing. Um, here's kind of an intuitive explanation of what goes on when the learning rate is too slow or too high. I think the picture really speaks for itself, so I'm going to leave it for you to stare at later. Um, okay, second thing is simpl uh, simplifying either the data or the problem. Possibly you're working on a piece of data which is maybe kind of five steps ahead of what anything or anyone has tried to solve until today. And if you're using standard methods, try first to maybe simplify it into something more standard. See if the standard tools work on standard data and then try switching either. And uh, the first, I talked about the second, so the first thing is try overfitting a small piece of data. If you're not able to overfit on like one or 10 training examples, probably something in your, in your mechanism is wrong. Okay, uh, the next is normalization. Even the best, you know, optimizers can fail if the data is not well normalized. There should be this, oh, there we go. So, I'm going to stay. Um, so, this seems like a nicely optimizable question, um, problem. Let's say this is one class, this is the other. But I can apply transform to this, so it looks kind of like, I don't know, something like this. So this here, the range of kind of plausible solutions seems to become much more narrow. And if you try to optimize this, any tiny change in one direction can be critical, whereas in the other direction, it can be negligible. So the solution to the problem becomes very unstable. So that's the gist of why you have to normalize data. Uh, there was a question there? No. Uh, okay. And of course, uh, try to add batch normalization layers. So that was kind of a common wisdom until a few months ago where people started really questioning the nature of batch normalization and why does it work or why does it not work? Um, so it is usually useful, but now things are uh, new things are starting to pop up. Um, so for example, to stabilize the training, you could try different initialization types. For example, if you initialize everything to zero, you won't have anything that breaks the symmetries in the optimization and things will be, uh, uh, will converge to you know, something um, very degenerate. Um, and a recent initialization called fix up initialization claims to promise the kind of um, useful properties of batch initialization, sorry, batch normalization, but without actually doing the batch normalization. And it claims to have some advantages over that. And uh, of course, try residual connections. Um, a couple of things that uh, indicate what could happen if you have good training behavior, so everything converges nicely, but it still doesn't seem to have a good test time behavior. So a very technical point, but I've fallen on this point many times, is to call model.eval when you're actually testing. So uh, specifically in PyTorch, and I'm guessing in other uh, frameworks, uh, if you train with batch normalization or dropout, these are things that should be applied when you're, or sort of parameters that should be updated when you're training, but shouldn't be when you're testing. So if you did not call this, uh, or the equivalent in another language uh, during testing time, you'll see all sorts of crazy, crazy results, and doing this may just resolve them. Um, yeah, okay, and 
obviously you should test for overfitting. So if your training loss goes down, but yeah. 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 Okay, so I'm guessing that when I said debug, I meant that in a broader kind of meaning of making things that don't work, work. Um, so it's either finding the problem or changing the solution. Uh, I agree that that may not have been a very accurate word, but um, okay. Okay, obviously testing for overfitting. Uh, there's this simple heuristic uh, that if your training loss keeps going down or stays constant and the test loss goes up, then you're overfitting. Okay? Um, yeah, so this again refers to my inaccuracy about debugging versus changing you know, the solution entirely. Um, you can try tweaking the size of the network or its capacity. Um, yeah, and another thing which I'm not sure is very well known, but I've learned this from my experiments. A lot of times you're tempted to use these adaptive gradient methods like Adam, which is really neat and it seems to converge quickly at first. But uh, a lot of recent papers, uh, actually you can look at literature and you see that pretty much everyone who wants to get state-of-the-art results uses SGD. And you can ask yourselves, uh, yourselves why. I mean, SGD seems much slower, uh, slower. You need like 10 times more epochs or something. So why not save the time in computation and use uh, Adam. So apparently, Adam converges uh, quickly initially, but uh, eventually after many epochs, it seems that SGD has kind of the upper hand or the lower loss. Um, so if things seem kind of weird, I would go with SGD and, uh, and leave the Adam alone for now. Uh, though a word of uh, kind of in parentheses, yeah. I've tried that, and it was a very limited kind of experiment that I did, but for me it didn't work. But I'm positive that a good engineer can make it work, you know, in a better way. Yeah. Sorry, so you're saying if you choose Adam, should you use weight decay as usual? Uh, well, usually Adam does have its own kind of default set of parameters, and I've found that diverging from them too much. It also has things which are, I think, akin to weight decay and, decay and momentum. Um, but usually stick with the default set of parameters and change them if it doesn't work. Now, I'm not saying it's totally useless, and in some rare cases uh, it has worked for me better than, better than SGD. Um, and uh, also I wanted to mention that in recurrent neural networks, it does seem that these adaptive gradient methods do seem to work better. So I'm talking about these normal feedforward things. Uh, but you should really, you know, try to see what most of the people are doing here and um, kind of use the common wisdom. Um, okay. Okay. So obviously uh, the data, uh, it's kind of self-explanatory if data uh, is too noisy. So networks have been shown to be somewhat robust to data noise, but don't push them too hard. Um, you should shuffle the data for training, so you don't want to different training batches to be, or training epochs to be too correlated, or uh, also you don't want a single mini batch to contain all instances of, I mean, instances only of a single class. So that's sort of a small scale imbalance and of course you don't want to have a large scale imbalance where you have one example of one class and a thousand of another. Um, and of course uh, visualize, uh, test if the images make sense, you haven't jumbled up the, uh, the dimensions of the images, somehow transposed the width and the depth or something crazy and if the text isn't in some language that you don't understand, if you should understand it and uh, so on. And try to also visualize uh, um, activations, at least within the early layers, uh, that you could use to get some intuition about uh, what's going on. Uh, and finally, uh, this is, I have one anecdotal example of this, but there's a, been a recent paper that has shown that deep networks, convolutional networks, aren't really translation invariant, although we all imagine them to be translation invariant. 
And uh, in fact, this is not a, uh, because any of the above things I mentioned, this is about just people for ages haven't been using the very basic domain knowledge that every signal processing, every person here who has taken a signal processing course should know about, which is that if you take data and you subsample it before filtering first, you'll get aliasing. And this means they basically uh, destroy a part of the signal when propagating it uh, deeper in the network. And this pretty much applied to all deep uh, networks, convolutional deep networks with sampling that, uh, that you have today. Uh, so it's really, you know, kind of avoiding this uh, fun part of let's just have a lot of data and a lot of parameters and try to hope that it works and really think about the domain knowledge that you have, which is generally a good idea, I think. Uh, yeah, and uh, bonus is uh, when I said earlier that you don't have to worry if you don't have any GPUs. So who has heard of this, Google Colab? Ah, good. So a good amount of people haven't heard of it. So for those of you who don't have a GPU, let's... Uh, there's something called Google Collaboratory. Basically, that's all you need uh, to know, but I'm going to go on anyway. Uh, so this is uh, Google Collaboratory. Basically, it looks pretty much like a Jupyter notebook, which, is, which it is in a sense. Only the thing is that the computation doesn't happen on your computer. It happens somewhere in Google. Let's call it that. I don't really know where. And the fun time, uh, the fun part is that you can do... You're not really seeing this, are you? Uh, let's... Okay. There is this runtime, change runtime type, and then you can pick if you want none, which none of, of you would want, or pick a GPU, which is what you can do in any case uh, for any kind of framework you're using. For example, if you want, want to run things with PyTorch, or you can pick on a TPU, which for those of you who don't know, it's like a GPU with steroids, but without the illegal parts. It's a really strong GPU, okay? Um, and uh, you can do this currently, you can pick using a TPU, um, if you're using TensorFlow, they intend to um, kind of make the support for TPUs broader in the future, so you will be able to use PyTorch. Yeah, what's the question? Yeah, so, so this is all free. That's the main point here. I mean, I'm not just uh, going on about this for uh, no reason. Uh, the point is that you can use this GPU or TPU computation online for free anytime you like. The only caveat is that it's kind of preemptive. It means that I think you get it for, and now I'm not totally sure of this, so you'll have to check me, for 24 hours, and then it kind of dies off on you. Uh, but that's okay, as long as you keep all of your data in your own storage, like Google Drive, for which you have an interface here, then it's fine. So this means that, aside from having to do some bookkeeping, you can always have a GPU for free. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Probably not. I don't think you should plan training for seven years anyway. I know, I know, I know. Uh, seven days, for example, uh, 70 days, okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll, I guess it's mainly for prototyping. I don't know if they have any policies about, uh, you mean abusing their computational resources? Good question, you'll have to read up on it, but um, I know that, I think that some people have already published papers based only on this kind of uh, computation. So, I mean, Use it now, worry about it later. Is this being recorded? <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so TPUs, GPUs for free, that was uh, my main point here. And let's see, do we have anything else? Uh, no, we don't have anything else. So additional resources for this part about debugging neural networks are listed here. Obviously, don't forget to have fun, and I'm running you that everything will be online, so you can, uh, you will have it uh, later. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's it. <laughs>